Okay. Um, nada. Can yes, I just it. can I just ask? Can you see the PowerPoint on the screen and the subtitles appearing? Yes, but the subtitles are very small. Okay. Yes, yes, I can see them. They're clear. Excellent. Right. Well, firstly, welcome to this information session on positive discipline. Traditionally, we have lots of activities to do. Um, obviously, we're somewhat hampered by being online, but hopefully we can make this interesting and we can engage you as much as possible. There are many different types of child discipline, and it's important to acknowledge this. Positive discipline is just one type of discipline. In the bottom left corner is a style of child discipline called emotion coaching. Now, emotion coaching is very, very effective, and that's a strong positive. It helps a child work through their emotions and come to a positive conclusion. The challenge with emotion coaching is it's actually very difficult to do, and you require a significant amount of training to do this effectively in a way that the child benefits from. If we look at behaviour modification, behaviour modification is very simple. It goes back to uh, Skinner and the behavioralists and rats being electrocuted. If I offer the rat a cheese and it eats the cheese, it doesn't get electrocuted. If I offer the rat the cheese and it does not eat the cheese, it gets electrocuted. Now this is very simple and it relies only on external factors influencing our behaviour. And I'm sure we're all aware that whilst we are influenced by certain external factors, we're also very much influenced by our own internal motivation, what drives us as individuals and how we respond to situations. And often behaviour modification is more about fear modification and successful behavioural changes are often happen because the individual is scared rather than the individual has actually changed. And when they're out of that situation of fear, the behaviour still exists. Boundary based is again very simple. It's a set of rules. You do this, you lose that. And there is a, obviously a place for that as there is for every type of um, effective discipline strategy. It is in many ways very straightforward and easy to understand, but it's very simplistic. You do this, you lose that. There's no real development in the long term. Uh, gentle behaviour discipline, again, is very similar to emotion coaching. And it requires, in the same way that emotion coaching does, actually quite a lot of training and a lot of time. It's very challenging. Positive discipline differs from the other styles of discipline, and it differs because it's about us as adults behaving like adults in a situation where something has gone wrong or there's potentially conflict. And the challenges with it are that we get it wrong and that we have to self-reflect and we have to think, mm, what did I do there? And the second challenge is that we actually have to understand what it is that we want and what our boundaries are. We can't possibly move forwards with a child identifying where things went wrong and um, understanding calmly what's happened and moving towards a resolution or uh, some form of punishment if required or whatever is the next stage if we ourselves don't know where the boundaries are. So really the challenge with positive discipline is that we have to understand what the boundaries are and we have to understand why we have those boundaries. So positive discipline is about being kind and firm at the same time and it is effective from very young all the way up to, well, adults really and fairness. Um, the strategies that are used in positive discipline are often used in uh, management of staff as an adult. Um, they're used with teenagers and they can be used with infants. It doesn't mean it's easy, but what it does mean is it's actually an effective all age strategy with caveats, of course. So the question we have to ask ourselves in regard being kind and firm at the same time, if you as an individual are too kind, why are you too kind? And if you understand that, 
then you can amend that. And if you as an individual are too firm, why are you too firm? Often parents will say, oh, well, they were upset and, you know, well, OK, that's a reason for being kind. But is that the underlying reason for you or is it that it's simpler to move forward in that situation? If you're too firm, parents will say, well, so and so needs to see that this, there's a consequence or so and so needs to see me doing something, in which case the reason for being firm is not about a resolution. It's about outside people watching. So how do we look at this? Well, we're going to look at something called fight, flight and freeze. And there's a really quite pleasant graphic explaining it there. And again, there's another graphic with flight, fight and freeze clearly displayed. And this third graphic has fight, flight and freeze, but it also has a fourth. And this is actually quite new, this concept of flourish, that in times of crisis, some people do very well. And if we if we think about it, we know this because otherwise organisations like the special forces wouldn't recruit certain types of people. Otherwise, certain types of business managers wouldn't be parachuted into businesses that are are in a difficult and challenging situation. And it's the same with children. Some children flourish exceptionally well in circumstances where others would hit fight, flight and freeze. It's about a response. Now, I'm going to show you, I hope, <laughs> a short video. So could I ask Nada, if the video doesn't play for whatever reason, that you inform me? I much appreciate that. Now, the video itself is very short. It's about a minute and a half, and it explains clearly fight, flight and freeze. And it does it in the context of a school scenario. But this is easily relatable to any scenario with a young child. And the understanding of this helps us to move forwards with positive discipline because it's one of the foundations. You know that scared or nervous feeling you get when you have to do something you're not sure you can do or go somewhere you've never been before? That feeling is called anxiety. I do apologize. Um, start that again. So. And it can feel a bit different for each person, but it usually doesn't feel very nice. Maybe your palms get sweaty or your body tenses up or maybe you get a tummy ache. Maybe you've heard of anxiety or maybe you haven't, but you've definitely felt it before because everyone feels that sometimes it's normal. You want to know something really weird about anxiety? It's actually trying to help you. It's true. All those uncomfortable feelings, those happen because your brain thinks you're in danger and it wants to protect you. When our muscles tense up and we sweat, it gets us ready to do a lot of exercise, which is helpful if you need to jump out of the way of a runaway train or wrestle a Wolverine. Sometimes our minds go blank and we feel like we can't move or talk. That would be great if we needed to hide. Instead, we just feel stuck. When your brain does this, it's called fight, flight, or freeze. The problem is, sometimes your brain gets confused and it can't tell the difference between a charging moose and say, going to a new school. Both things can be scary and cause anxiety, but there aren't any dangerous wild animals at a new school, hopefully. Understanding where anxiety comes from is the first step in learning to deal with it. So the next time you're in one of those tough situations and you start. So I'm not sure why the videos pause, but that's OK. We can. You know, that's now. Why is that important? Well, it, it's simple. And it's the same is true for kids at school as it is for children at home or when you take them somewhere. When you walk in and, and little Johnny has drawn in felt marker all over the wall and you go, what are you doing? Oh, 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 stop. And they look at you with that look of just like, oh, and they stop moving. That is the fright mode. And 
it's not that they're not necessarily replying because they don't want to. It's because their brain has shut down. They're in self-protection mode. And it's the same when children run away from a situation when something's happened. Uh, if an adult is scary and they run away and the adult's going, come back here now, and the child's legged it, they're not being anything other than scared and they're operating in a defensive mode. Their brain has stopped effectively reasoning and they are in survival mode. And <laughs> uh, or when two children are having a scuffle when they're very young, it's not that they're intending to physically hurt somebody else at that age. Quite often their brains have shut down over something. And often for us, it's like, really? The yellow dinosaur? But for the child at that moment in time, it's the most important thing in the world. But the key here is they have stopped thinking effectively. And that's really important. And it's something that we all do. And we see it with adults and we see it in the workplace and we see it with family members when there's a situation where they're challenged over something and they physically shut down. You can see that their speech or they become angry about something or they just try to run away, whether in reality or sort of metaphorically. Young children do the same. Now, what is important about this is that in this stage, the young child is not thinking effectively. In the same way, if we think about the last time any of us got cross or angry or upset about something and or you go around and your friend is upset, they're like, it's not fair, they did this and this happened. And then, oh, oh, oh. When you sit with them, you say, well, let's talk about this rationally and logically. What you could try doing is ABC and then so-and-so will respond EFG and then what we could and your friend or your family member is just looking at you going, all I want you to do at this point in time is tell me how I'm feeling. Acknowledge me. Acknowledge my feelings. I don't care about a solution. I'm not bothered. I just want you to understand how I feel. And the same is true with young children. So the fight, flight, freeze mode is something that we try to avoid in positive discipline. Or if the child moves into it, we want to remove them from it because what we want is a solution to what is in essence a problem or a challenge. Now, uh, for those of you who logged on earlier, I talked about the hand and I showed a picture of a hand. Now, the hand you see on the screen on the left is an adult hand. That's not the kind of hand we're going to be talking about, the formation with the thumb over. We're going to be talking about the child's hand with the thumb inside the fingers. And when we do the next activity, it's important to remember the thumb inside the fingers. Whoa, looks complicated, but it isn't. This is a very simple way to show how the brain is when it's open to reason and it's listening. So if you can at home, and I realize this may look silly with people around, you might think you're about to punch the, you know, the laptop or the computer screen. If you can make with your hand the fist you can see in number one. And if you remember, the thumb goes under the fingers. OK, I'm now working on the assumption you've all made this fist. Your wrist, imagine your wrist is the spine. And to help you, I've written the word the spine with an arrow here. This area here, your fist is now representing your brain. Inside the thumb, and the area by the thumb, is your limbic area. It's your emotions, it's your fight, flight, freeze. It's your brain cell, it's your um, base, base responses to situations. Your fingers covering this are your cortex, and these control your reason and your thinking. Especially the finger areas, the tips, the fingertips. This helps to control the thumb. You can feel you've actually got your thumb in control there. You can feel what your thumb is doing and you can stop it. Now, in, in number two, we're about to enter a state of conflict. And I'm sure because you're being reasoned and you're thinking, you can look at picture one and picture three and imagine what picture two looks like. And you can put your hand into that imagined state. And you can feel 
that as your fingers open into state two, the control of your limbic area, your base of motions is being lost. Now, we don't ever lose reason, but reason becomes less reliable as it is removed from the emotion. And then in stage three, we're basically in fight, fright, flight, fight, freeze mode. Our, our reason is now lost to us as a reliable option at this moment, in the same way that you think about the last time you got particularly upset about something. Uh, logic goes out of the window most of the time for most people. The last time you dealt with somebody who was deeply upset, logic has gone. Emotion has taken over. There is still reason there. There is still logic, but it's not a reliable factor in this scenario. And what we want, and the important thing about positive discipline is, A, keeping the brain in state one, or moving from state three, flight, fight, freeze, or state two, entering a state of conflict, back to state one. Because only in state one are our emotions and reason working effectively together. And if we want to resolve a situation, they need to be working effectively. Otherwise, reason is gone and we're down to fear as an option for successful response. And as I'm sure we're all aware, fear only works in a context. It's not a long term solution. Oh, there's a picture too, <laughs> just in case. Emotions are the fuel behind our actions. There is something called the reason emotion continuum. I'm not going to go into detail on this, but it shows that reason and emotion are strongly linked for a successful future. OK, so we've looked at the fact that we need to have a calm state of mind. We want reason and emotion working together. We want the thumb under the fingers. We want the base emotions being controlled by reason. The second key aspect of positive discipline is the language we use. Um, quite often with children and also with teenagers and adults, uh, we say stop stop, don't, no, do not, what are you? And it, this is often seen as A, being strong and clear, and B, communicating what not to do. And, and in some ways, yes, absolutely, those are true statements. But there are several things to bear in mind. Um, when you walk in a room and little Johnny is drawing on the wall with permanent marker, and you go, what are you doing? Do not draw on the walls. The moment that child or that adult, and we can look at our own experiences here, falls into a state of stage three, that the thumb has pulled away from the fingers, in essence, we've actually stopped listening to effectively what's being said, and we only really pick up the final words of a sentence or the final few words. So when we're saying, what are you doing? Do not draw on the walls. There's a very good chance the child hasn't heard most of that, and they've just heard draw on the walls. Also, we are telling people what not to do. That leaves a whole array of different options about what they can do. Actually, what we want to be saying is what we want them to do as opposed to not do. So as an add on to that, and this is a small aside, there is a huge difference between please and thank yous. If we say to somebody, please, it's a bargaining term. Please do this which means, oh, go on, go on, I'd like you to do this. Whereas thank you is an acknowledgement of an action. So we can be polite, but thank you is a stronger term of politeness because it's acknowledging an action that's going to be completed. It's not saying, mm, go on, do it for me, that'd be nice. It's saying you're doing it, much appreciated. Now, positive languages are not about developing a weak stance. It's not about saying it in a weak voice and being, oh, please don't do that, or mm, thank you. You have to be firm, you have to be strong, and otherwise the child will not identify with it. But it doesn't mean aggressive and it doesn't mean scary. So if you're somewhere and a child is shouting, you can say, stop shouting. But um, one of the things that is most amusing is when you see an adult shouting at a child to stop shouting and the adult is shouting, it's not leading by example. As I'm sure many of you do, this is little voice time. 
we are talking. This is a talking voice time. I'm now communicating exactly what to do. You've gone to grandma's. Little Claire is running around. So saying stop running. We walk in this room. We are now walking. Thank you. So we're communicating what it is we want. We're being very clear to the child about what the forthcoming expectation is or the current expectation. Again, no hitting. Often young children hit out and they're in fight, flight and fright mode. They're not being malicious. Often it's they're talking with their body parts because their language is not at the stage to communicate a complex thought in their head. So they respond physically. So instead of no hitting, keep your hands to yourself is a very simple and straightforward message. Stop grabbing. Use your words to explain what you want. You're giving a clear message to the child. What are you doing? Do not draw on the walls in there. Freeze. Pretty effective. And then instead of do not throw, carry it to the box. So positive language is about explaining actually what we want to happen. Um, and this links with something called, and I'm going through this, I realise quite quickly, which is why we're videoing it, connection before correction. And this just links exactly what we've been looking at. So connection means acknowledge the feelings. In much the same way when we look back, and we've been in an emotional state. We don't want solutions. We want somebody to say. That sounds frustrating. That must be really frustrating. I can see that you're very upset. I can see how angry you are about this. I can see how sad you are about this. Oh. Thank you for acknowledging that. Thank you for understanding. Ha. Huh. And it's not unusual. There is a way that we're going to look at how this works. And it's about active listening, which we'll get on to. So the most important thing is to look and to listen. Because at this point, they're in flight, fright, freeze mode. Their, their reasoning is not strong. You're making a judgment. You're listening to the words. I can see you're angry. In the same way that we would say to each other. But for children, you have to keep it simple because A, it's language and B, their emotional understanding, as we will come to see, works on basic level to do with vocabulary. Once you have established. I can see that you're angry about this and the situation is calm. Then you can then move on to the next stage. It's normal to be angry in this situation but it is not OK to hit. It's OK to be cross by X, Y, Z. I understand that, blah, blah, blah. But I don't like it when you shout at me. It is not how we act. In this family, we talk to each other. Now, all this sounds amazing um, on the page. When I have a situation within the family and my children that I wish to deal with, and there is something going on. I myself have to take the role of the adult because ultimately my two children are children. I am the adult. But sometimes it's been a long day. I'm not at my best. I try to be at my best most of the time, but I'm often not. And times I will go, OK, I can see this is potentially a disastrous situation approaching me. I can see the chasm of doom in front of me. And I will say, I'm going to make a cup of tea. Would you like a cup of tea and a biscuit as well? And it's not important if the child wants a cup of tea and biscuit. Obviously, at the age of two and three, no a cup of milk or something. But my children are slightly older. But what that does is it gives me two to three minutes to go and make a drink and get a small snack and then to go somewhere and sit. Now, we don't always have two to three minutes when children are three, four, five. Sometimes it's 10 to 15 seconds, but it's just enough time for us to go into adult mode. My child is angry about something. The scenario they're in 
It's not necessarily great, but I want a successful resolution and I want this not to happen again. So I need to buy myself time to become the adult in this situation. And the children appreciate it, in my experience. Now, in regards commenting on emotions, it doesn't matter if you get it wrong. If you say it's OK to be angry, this is what I'm hearing. And they go, I'm not angry, I'm sad. That's fine. You then say, OK, well, it's OK to be sad. The, the appreciation of your attempt to understand the emotion is what matters, not about your accuracy in getting the right vocabulary. Frustrated, irked, ired, annoyed, irritated, nah, I mean different things to different people, but the attempt to get it right is what's important. So as part of positive discipline, we want to maintain the child's dignity. We want to give them encouragement because it's the best way to move forward. So that doesn't mean we say, oh, well done, you threw paint everywhere, brilliant. What it does mean is that if they make an attempt to listen and to rectify what's going on, that's what we support. And most importantly, like us, we never put a child in a corner. We always give them an escape option. Because like us, if we're put in a corner with no escape option, we have one option left and it's not to seek a solution that works. As a recap, when your child has done something, uh, there's a distressing emotion with three, four, five, often upset, often angry, often refusal to do something. Uh, stubbornness can be seen as part of it. And then once the stubbornness is hit, then it moves into another emotion beyond it when they realize that this isn't quite working. Stop. Pause, respond, buy yourself the time, name the feelings, give it vocabulary. Allow the child to understand that you are understanding them and then you can move forwards in that rational stage where the fingers are closed over the thumb. Like that. The third most important to re thing to realise is actually becoming an adult takes a long time long time. It's not easy. It really isn't. And it's very easy for us because we know our children to think that they're older than they are. We can put confirmation bias on what we're looking at. We can see examples that make us think our children are years above everybody else. Oh, they're so mature. They understand this. They understand that. Not necessarily. In some cases, perhaps in some areas, but generally becoming an adult takes a long, long time. And it takes a lot of getting things right and getting things wrong. And sometimes we can forget that. And that's part of the reason why we have to take a step back when there's a situation, because we are responsible for being the adult. We do not expect the child to act like an adult when they're being emotional. So uh, I'm not gonna show you all this video, but there is a relevance. I hope you can see it. In case you wonder, at the end of the line here, there's somebody surfing. Now, imagine being four and trying to do that. See, I look at life and the challenges life faces in much the way as big wave surfing. I used to surf a long time ago, um, not big waves, clearly. But the wave is a big thing and life is a big thing and we do our best to cope and we do our best to balance. And at some point, everything crashes around us. And that's when we need to be able to cope. And that's when we need to be able to deal with the situation we're in with calm and balance. Now, somebody surfing a wave like that 
has spent a lot of time practicing. They've had a lot of positive experiences in that situation and they're able to come out of it at the other end when those challenges happen calmly and successfully. We couldn't expect a four year old to face a scenario like that and I'm sure you wouldn't want that to happen and I'm not suggesting that you would expect a four year old to face that kind of scenario. But when I talk about the adult being the adult and not expecting the child to be the adult, this is what I'm referring to. So we have to look at brain development. In the first year, actually for many years, brain development is a serve and return process between the child and the, the caregiver. There's interaction back and forth, 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 back and forth. And this helps to create synaptic links in the brain. And the way that we interact with our child helps to create certain links. We are the most formative socialising influence in our children at the ages of three to five as family members. So the brain is an incredibly complex thing. After the first year, complex circuits, the complex synaptic circuits, and I have a very short video for this, are built on the very early simple circuits that are created in the first year. Those that go through that back and forth tennis rally get stronger. Those that are ignored, get chopped, get pruned, disappear. There we go, it's a pair of prunes. Or oh, pruning shears. Now, this video is about a minute and a half, but it will ex nicely explain the synaptic connections that are happening in the brain and how we interact with our child and how our child responds to us and then how we respond to our child's response helps to build the pathways. And really, we're talking about our child being 18 at the end of this process. This is what we're building for. We're not building for the moment. We're building an individual for the future. And everything we do is about building that child up to being an adult that can go out into the world and survive and thrive. <laughs> A child's experiences during the earliest years of life have a lasting impact on the architecture of the developing brain. Genes provide the basic blueprint, but experiences shape the process that determines whether a child's brain will provide a strong or weak foundation for all future learning, behavior, and health. During this important period... Huh. During this important period... It stop. ...earliest years of life determines whether a child's brain will provide a strong or weak foundation for all future learning, behavior, and health. During this important period... Okay, that's unfortunate. Let me see if I can get it to go. No, for some reason the video isn't playing, so I will move on. What the video does is it just reinforces what I've said. It shows synapses being made as connections are made in the child's brain. And then as certain types of behavior don't happen often, they disappear, they're chopped. And the behavior types that happen most often are reinforced. So if, and I'm not suggesting from Emmy does this, there is a scenario where a child does something and then they are shouted at, and then the child screams back and the adult shouts back and the child screams back and the adult shouts back, that's that back and forth. And they're the synapses that are being built and reinforced over time as a response to certain scenarios. Now, during the first three years, a lot happens in the brain, but it doesn't stop. It doesn't suddenly get to the child's third birthday and the brain goes, that's it. We're shutting down. It's all over here. Pack your things up. Let's go. Finished. It's not. The brain is usually complicated. And because of that, we keep on going and we keep on developing and we're able to adapt, but not as effectively as in the first three years. Now, very quick, I don't want to spend too much time on this chart. Along the base, we can see minus eight, that's months, and it goes along, and then you have birth. And then it goes one, two, three, four, five, six. This is still months along the base. And then it starts on years along the base, one, two, three, all the way up to 15. 
So sensory pathways, visions and hearing, wow, human brain development is massive in the first year and then carries on up to about six. Language, and you will find different charts. This is not the only one. You can find comparisons and they will have slightly different bits of information on. Language really, really takes off here and again carries on. All the way up to five, but diminished. Now, the infant here has shifted, unfortunately, <laughs> during the process of copying. That should be over here. I do apologise. The higher cognitive function, the reasoning, the thinking, it takes off and it keeps going. Three, four, five. So the higher cognitive functions are really peaking in the infant section. And it's during this age of three to five that those synapses are making connections on the way we interact. So if we're looking at positive discipline, we are looking at acknowledging the child's emotion. We're looking at preventing flight, fight and freeze through clear instructions beforehand, through communication. If there's a problem, we're looking at a process where we're calm and rational. <laughs> Good luck with that all the time. And then we're acknowledging and listening to the child. And then we're feeding back what we're hearing. And then we're saying, OK, well, this is how we're going to move forward. So given in mind that with a two and three year old, that isn't so easy. Those synapses are being formed. And it's not that every time we will have a successful outcome, but it means as the child gets older, that is the process that's reinforced. And the type of language being used is the type of language that is reinforced. And the concept of we have a solution is reinforced and we're talking long term for when that child becomes a teenager 12 13 14 when things get interesting as opposed to obviously being interesting for the rest of their lives which they are fascinating creatures now very briefly because i'm aware that time is moving on mental expectations and the social and emotional expectations for a child of your child's age so your child might be three, four or five, and there will be key milestones. So that we can help us understand what is a child and what is an adult and what may lay in between. We're going to look at these key milestones. And then the trick here is how would this impact on supporting in the connection or the correction stage? Connection being, I hear what you're saying. I can see your cross, blah, blah, blah. Correction being, it's not OK too or that's not what we do in this family. So your child is at the pre-operational stage. Logical reasoning has got a long way to go. They can represent their thinking. They can use symbols and gestures and words, but we're considering mental and social and emotional expectations. Right. I group together all the information, egocentric. Children struggle, cannot understand the world from other people's perspective. So when we say to them, how do you think little Billy feels when you covered him in pink paint? Really, our child has no idea. Truthfully, we can lead them to that, but at this point, they struggle to see the world from anybody else's perspective apart from their own. They can say what they think they, you want them to say, but the reality is, unless they are supported, they're going to struggle to view that perspective, especially if they're in an emotional state, if they're in the, the fight, fight, freeze state. The reason is gone. And to understand other people's viewpoint, we need reason intact for developing empathy. OK, children can think of events in the past or events that are going to happen. So there's cause, there's consequence. That's great. Which they're starting to understand, but not complicated. If you do this, what's going to happen? Uh, the cat will get food if I throw sausages on the floor. Well, yes, you're right. But what I mean is the floor will be dirty, so we'll have to clean it up, blah, blah, blah. So the cause and consequence is simple and we can't expect them to suddenly, because we're frustrated, have a stronger understanding of cause and effect. 
Um, they do learn by imitation and observation. And as much as we may not like to admit it, and whilst they may not do it in front of us, they copy us. Um, I have done all sorts of positive discipline with my children, and I have heard, whilst they don't do it with me, they're like, oh, stop doing that, Dad, it's so annoying. I know you know what I feel. Please, stop it. I hear them doing it with their friends, and I have heard them doing it with their friends. And they've come back and they've talked about situations um, where there's been arguments in the friendship groups, and they, they say, I did this and this, and it's like, blimey, wow, that's amazing. They copy us. We are the most important things in our children's lives. So, of course, they copy us. And they copy the positive and they copy the negative. Um, this links to starting to under can understand cause and effect. They're beginning to understand the before and after, the consequences. And the truth is they get easily bored. They have a lack of focus. So if this whole thing is going to take five minutes, the chances are they've forgotten what happened. They're just remembering the emotion. Because when we get emotional, especially strongly emotionally, our brain floods with chemicals and it impedes our short term memory. So if Johnny doesn't remember what they did five minutes ago, it's quite likely that Johnny actually doesn't remember what they did five minutes ago. They just know they're really upset about something. Social and emotional. They can understand basic emotions, happy, sad. But abstract emotions, pity, greedy, these kind of more complicated emotions, they can nod, but really, they're not getting it. So if we're talking about emotions, we need to keep it simple. And if we want an expectation of understanding of something like pity, we have to lead them to it step by step. Sometimes kids close their eyes. Sometimes that's to do with the freeze. Sometimes it's to do with controlling their emotions. It's shutting down um, external stimulus. They're trying to get themselves under control. And the worst thing I've seen is I was in a school and child was in a difficult situation this was many years ago not here many years ago and the teacher was like blah 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 and the child shut their eyes and the teacher was like open your eyes look at me when i'm talking to you well, that's the teacher's need for respect that's not understanding that the kid is actually desperately trying to get a grip of what's going on and they're not being rude because socially and emotionally age three to five this is what they do um they can be more verbally aggressive than they intend to be they don't have that filter in place. Sometimes they say things like, yeah, 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 yeah. and they're far stronger than they intend to be. Did you really mean to say that? No, no, mummy, I didn't. Um, they can follow social rules. They have a strong understanding. We are social creatures. Age four, turn taking starts to kick in. So at age three, if they're snatching, and this is variable, it's because they want to play with it. It's not because they've got a good understanding of who takes turn, and that's where we have to support them. OK, we're going to go into this room. There are several toys. Your turn is after Johnny, and we will do waiting together. And I will let you know when it's your turn. Positive language. And this is important. If your child tells you a small white lie, you know it. They're not doing it because they're a liar. Um, and they will do it to get out of trouble. But in part, it's to do with their developing understanding of how you see them and not getting the construct of a liar. They don't want your image of them to change. So often small white lies are about them maintaining your image of them as your little darling. So if they are telling small white lies. Yes, it needs addressing, but it's not something that needs addressing because they're lying. Oh, they're a liar. It's because they're concerned about the image you have of them and they're doing it to protect that image, which is the most important thing to them. You are the most important thing in the world. Um, and they will watch your reaction. They will say and do things to see how you react. And this goes all the way back to those synaptic connections and how we respond is part of positive discipline because we are building for the future with our children. Yeah, they can still have tantrums. Um, it's just a massive reaction to something and quite often, like, what was that really about? And it's, um, they took the cowboy that I wanted. 
Okay, <laughs> but for the child, and this is important, that was hugely important, even though we don't understand the importance for them, it's massively important. This is just a completely important point. This bit in orange, the prefrontal cortex, um, we talked about this is the fingertips going over the, the emotions, the, the brain stem, um, the prefrontal cortex, the bit that controls our reasoning, doesn't finish developing for wild guess. Oops, wrong. 25 years. 25 years it takes pretty much. So everything we're doing really is about supporting our children all the way through. And prefrontal cortex looks at what is wrong, morality, how we control our emotions, how we respond instead of react. OK. I am overrunning slightly. I do apologize about this. I hope that you're bearing with me. I won't be much longer. So positive discipline and um, building relationships. This is really important. How much quality time do we spend with our children? And I don't mean while they're watching a film and we're on the computer. They're watching a film, are we sat next to them? If we're watching a film, are we sat next to them on our phone because we don't like the cartoon? The child is interested that you're interested in what you're doing. If you sit and play on your phone, that's sending a message. If you read to your child, and I'm sure everybody does, that's sending a message. If we just spend time with them for no real reason, that's sending a message. And the more time we spend with our child, the more connections we make. Part of positive discipline is about building relationships. It's not about quantity. It's about the quality of the time. When we're with the child, are we with them? Now, this is just a small, small thing. None of this has to be very difficult. And I'm sure you've all seen this. You've, you've got your four year old and they're toddling around and they've done something. And again, it's rather than language, they look up at you and you just give them a thumbs up and a smile. And the response is remarkable. You're, you're reinforcing that they've done something without going into a big dialogue about it. This is also positive reinforcement. This is the same as we're walking. This is a talking room. You're saying, yes, that's what I like. Without lots of language that they've got lost in, they understand it, they get it. It's like, yeah. All right, the who didn't wake mummy sticker chart. Okay, personal experience. Um, when my second child was about two or three, she had a, don't mention this to her, she'll be mortified horrible habit of waking up and because they were both in the same room the other one would wake up and then they'd all come in and wake us up fantastic so for about six months or four months i don't remember i was so sleep deprived would be woken up five times a night now options okay i don't want to be woken up four or five times a night the child has developed a habit about waking up for whatever reason and they get out of bed they come in they crawl into the bed with us which is great, but they insist on doing things like the starfish and snoring and rolling around and then waking up when the sun comes in and insisting on talking incessantly, um, like small children do. So, you can shout at the child in the middle of the night, which is a very quick fear-based response, but when they've had that nightmare and they're petrified or they've woken up and convinced that there actually is a monster in the room and they're too scared to come and tell us, that's not very helpful. At the same time, I don't really want to be woken up just because they've woken up and they want the glass of water that's next to them. So we created the who didn't wake mummy sticker chart. We explained it. We stuck it up in the kitchen first thing in the morning. Whoever didn't come in to wake mummy. And this was for specific non nightmare related wakings. They got one sticker and they put it on the sticker chart. Then in the car on the way to school, they had a smarty, I think it was, or a strawberry, whatever the, the, the thing was. It wasn't massive, but it, we set it up, we explained it, um, we got big sister involved, we set ourselves up for success. Sticker, bang, and then yes, and then in the car immediately. It's not long term, it's a very simple reward. Oh, look, it's almost like behavior modification, but it's with a big explanation around and lots of positives. The key here is we didn't just make it up. We thought about what would work for this situation. We understood what we wanted. If it's a nightmare, yes, you can come and wake us up anytime you want to any point. Outside that is the who didn't wake mummy sticker chart. So we knew what we were after. We knew what we wanted. We knew what our success criteria was. 
OK, slightly different slide. This goes back to what we've talked about before. Positive language. This is a key element of positive discipline. You tell what to do rather than what not to do. We're going to see grandma. We're going to grandma's. So beforehand, when we're at grandma's, we walk and we talk in our little voices. OK. So it's about explaining. It's about keeping the fist closed. It's about the child understanding in the terms of their understanding what the expectations are, rather than being caught legging it around screaming then having to deal with that in that state. And even if we do, okay, let's sit down. And that's an important point. I was in a school in a in the primary section or the elementary section as it is here, and I had a, a member of staff saying to a boy, sit down sit down, sit down, just sit down. Oh, so I wandered over in that annoying way that I have and I said, perhaps I can be of assistance. And uh, the staff member gave me that, like, I wish you'd go away, look, but okay. So I pulled up a chair and I sat on the chair and I then said to the boy, can you sit down? Thank you. I'd modelled what I wanted. The child sat down, it was remarkable. Active listening. Now, this is the difficult bit, and this is a session in its own right. And if there is enough requests, we can do a second session where we can focus on active listening, especially with younger children. And this is linked to the connection before correction. So, sit down here with me. Use your words. Explain what happened. The child talks. We don't interrupt. We let them talk. When they finish talking, let me check my understanding. Use the child's words back with him. And then he did this to the thingy and the thingy was cross and the thingy wanted, have I got this right? Okay. Now this is where the adult has the difficult role when you're three and four year old, you're then having to say, we don't really do that, that's not what's appropriate. But by this point, you've acknowledged the child's understanding, you can now move forward in a way the child will understand. Because what you want is this not to happen in the future. And not because the child is scared to do it, because they understand it's not what's appropriate. Not fear based, because when they're 13, they ain't going to be scared. Or if they are, you have to consider what we have to do to make them scared at that age. Challenges with children this age. Yes, it's difficult for young children. They do forget what's happened. They can shape reality. That, that frontal cortex has become flooded, but the more we do it, the more they understand the process of positive discipline, the more they remember what has actually happened, the more they understand that, OK, I've done this. Mummy will, daddy will sit down with me and do this and it will be talked through and they will listen and then we will go forward. And sometimes I might have my toy taken away for five minutes or sometimes I might have to tidy up the mess I've made. But mummy and daddy understand. And then it's over. And the next time I get what's happened, it's not just this blur where I've been told off and the snot bubbles the size of footballs everywhere. And I'm really upset. I get what's happened and it takes time and it takes practice. And we have to be understanding that it will take time because they are developing that higher order thinking. And we are responsible for developing that higher order thinking. And they are easily scared of your image. All this is part of it but we are building for the future. Now, this is a video on positive thinking, but I am aware that I have overrun. So I will um, leave the video on the PowerPoint and I will cease recording uh, this session, but I will put the video in an available location if anyone would like to see it. If you would like to have a follow-up session on active listening, please do send me an email and I will talk with um, Miss Nader about whether we can set one up and whether you feel this would be appropriate. I'm going to um, stop sharing my screen now. And I'm going to stop recording.